We're going to be in Psalms 96 to 100 tonight, Lord willing. Four-hour Bible study. You guys can handle that. Psalms 96 to 100 are messianic psalms, meaning they're about the coming of the Lord and and the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. This particular psalm, 96, actually was written by David in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 when he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem after it had been in the house of Abinadab for a long, long time. And This was a huge moment for David because David, being a man after God's own heart, passionate for the Lord, he so wanted to bring the presence of God into his community. He didn't want to have to go up to Shiloh or wherever uh, they had to go worship. He wanted God to be worshiped right there in Jerusalem. And so this was just a big, big thing for him. And so he wrote this psalm especially for that occasion. Um, and, and actually, he wrote Psalm 104, maybe it's 105, uh, and it goes along with that. If you read through 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles, excuse me, um, 16, both of those psalms are, are together there. Now, in this particular psalm, it's a it's psalm of praise to God for him coming in judgment. When Jesus comes, he's going to come to judge. And he gives over eight different ways that we can praise God. If you just do it, just a real quick glance, you see, sing, 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 proclaim, declare, um, fear, uh, give, 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 bring, worship, tremble, and say. And he just goes on like this. He's just giving all these like little pithy commands about how we can worship the Lord, how we can praise him. Verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. I begin by saying, sing to the Lord a new song. And this is something that comes up a lot in the Psalms. David saying, you know, I, I want to sing a new song to God. Now, this is fresh praise, and it's very important for us to get this in our Christian lives, is to have fresh praise to God. Um, Sometimes we can sing songs by rote. We're not even thinking about the words. We just know the tune, and so we're not even really engaging God in worship, but it's just rolling off our tongues, kind of like the Lord's Prayer was with some of us, you know, we... Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're not even thinking about that prayer because we know it off by heart. We can do that with songs too. But when you sing a new song, it's fresh. And God wants us to have fresh experiences with him, fresh testimonies of great things that he's done in our lives that we can sing to him about. And you know, this is what's happened all throughout church history is people have an experience with God, it's fresh, it's new, and they'll write a song about it. They'll take the, the truths of the word of God, they'll repackage them in the, the music of the day, and then they'll sing a new song to God. It just happens over and over again. We can do that individually. Lord, maybe I've sung this a hundred times, but Lord, I'm going to think about the words that I'm singing to you now. And we, we're really engaged with him. That's what it means. Singing a new song to the Lord, and David's always telling us to do that. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised, for he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now, I think this could mean one of two things. 
First of all, I think it means worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. God is holy. And when we talk about holiness, what we mean is that God is morally perfect. And God is whole. God is complete in and of himself. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything. He's just self-sustained and self-satisfied. He is complete. He's whole. So when he draws us into himself, he draws us into his wholeness, into his completeness. We are complete in the Lord. We worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Lord, I look around and all I see in the world is sinfulness. I look in my own heart and all I see is darkness. But I look at you and you're holy, you're perfect, you're pure in all your ways. And I just worship you for that. Holiness is attractive, it's beautiful. The beauty of holiness. But also, we worship him in the beauty of our holiness. So in other words, we, yeah, you're holy, but now that I'm a Christian, I want to be holy like you. And so I want to cooperate with you in sanctification. I want to become more and more like Jesus Christ. So as you prompt me by your spirit, as I'm reading your word and applying it to my life, as it's cutting me down to the core of my being, and I say, Lord, okay, I, I repent and, I, and I, I do that. We become holy and we begin to worship him more and more in the beauty of our holiness. So his holiness is beautiful, but we can worship him in the beauty of, of our holiness as well. By the way, it's not something that we can do on our own. We can't just become holy on our own. We need the power of his spirit and the direction and the power of his word in our lives. Otherwise, there's, there's no hope of becoming holy. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Now, when he says it shall not be moved, literally, um, the, the, the world shall not be shaken. This does indicate at what time he's talking about here. He's not talking about now, because the world is being shaken. It's going to be shaken more and more in the coming days and years and into the tribulation period. It's going to be shaken. But when Jesus comes back and establishes his kingdom for a thousand years on this earth, then the, the world is not going to be shaken. So this is what David, as he's writing under the power of uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is prophesying about this future reign of the Lord in that time the world will not be shaken. Um, there's going to be complete peace on this earth. I'm going to read to you about some shakings that are going to take place. Um, Isaiah 2, verse 19. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. This is speaking of judgment. He shakes the whole earth in judgment of wicked people. Isaiah 2.21. Go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags on the, of the rugged rocks. From the terror of the Lord and from the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Isaiah 13.13. 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place. In the wrath of of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Joel 3.16, the Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And then finally in the Old Testament, Haggai 2 verse 6, it says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more it is a little while I will shake heaven and earth, the sea, and dry land. He's talking about a shaking of judgment. And this is what's coming down upon the earth, specifically in the great tribulation period, that period of seven years after the God raptures the church, takes his bride up to heaven, and he pours out wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. He judges the world in righteousness. He shakes it. Now, we have a minor shaking going on 
as we speak. You know, the whole COVID thing that we've been going through this past year has been a shaking. The whole world has stopped for a while, you know, and, and, and it's just been people thinking about life and what, what's this all about? And, you know, that can be actually a very good thing because it gets people thinking about eternal things. And I'm really hoping that as things start to unlock, I'm looking at an evangelist here and, and others who want to get out and evangelize. I'm really hoping that as things open up and we're able to get out, that people's hearts will be really opened through what's taken place over this last year to hear the gospel message. I mean, our nation, you know, it's going down the tubes. The church is dying. But in, in those moments, you know, it's been said that the, the lowest ebb, EBB, is the turning of the tide. And this could be, in this nation, a turning of the tide where God pours out his spirit and brings people into the kingdom. Could be one of those uh, revivals that we've been praying for on a, on a local level, maybe even a national level or even an international level. Now, we know from the scriptures overall, things are just going to get going from good to bad, but there can be these localized and national revivals along the way. Maybe that's what will take place right now. God in his mercy pours out his spirit, brings people into the kingdom before the end comes. Praise, I hope he does. Verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Let all the trees of the woods, then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. I don't know if you noticed there, but there are three triplets in there. Sing, sing, sing. Give, give, give. Let, let, let. Like that. And you can kind of think about these things as, you know, these are things that God wants us to do. You know, he wants us to sing, sing, sing. He wants us to give, give, give. You know, our, our finances, our, our gifts of, of the body, and let. So, you know, let heaven rejoice. Let this, you know, this stuff is going to happen, you know, as, as God is getting ready to consummate uh, things in human history. Well, so be it, Lord. That's what we say. Let it happen. Psalm 97 a song of praise to the sovereign Lord. And again, it's a messianic song. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. Okay, so he's talking about the future now. as a future thousand-year reign of Christ. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. His lightnings light the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the peoples with glory. This is the coming of the Lord. Now I'm going to read to you what Jesus said about this in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 2. 24, verse 29. That's not the Sermon on the Mount. That's, this is the uh, Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Wow. This is what he's talking about. Jesus Christ, the visible return of Christ to this earth on the clouds with power and great glory. He's not talking about the rapture here. We even believe the rapture is in Matthew 24. He's talking about the second coming, which I believe comes seven years after the rapture, all the way to the earth to judge the world in righteousness. 
This is what the psalmist is talking about. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. That's interesting. Um, he mentions gods there. The, the Hebrew word is Elohim. And we've talked about that in past studies. It can be another word, like a general word for the true and the living God, Yahweh. It can also be a word for any God. It can also be a word for judges. The judges of Israel were called Elohim. But it can also be a word for angels and demons. So I believe that's what it's referring to here. You, you angels, you created beings, you worship him. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. Zion, of course, being a reference to Jerusalem. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the soul of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. You who love the Lord hate evil. One of the ways to tell whether you really love God or not is if you hate evil, if you hate sin. That is, if you can look at sin and just go, ah, oh, it's no big deal, or you kind of wink at it, or maybe you dabble in it a little bit, or if it repulses you and you think, oh, Lord, that thought that I had, that action, that word that I said, Lord, forgive me, I hate evil, I don't want to get near it. Says, you who love the Lord hate evil, hate evil. And actually, this would be the number one reason for unanswered prayer is that you have a secret affinity for evil. It tells us in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven, then I will forgive their sins, then I will heal their land. He's talking about his people. If they will turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear. Then I'll hear. But if they have a secret affinity for prayer, they love it. They don't want to turn from it. Man, their prayer life is not going to be very good. So, you who love the Lord hate evil. And then notice in verse 11, light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Now, how do we define light? Light reveals knowledge. So it's another kind of word for knowledge, symbolic of that. Um, it's also symbolic of guidance. You know, um, the, the psalmist talks about the, the, the word of the Lord being a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It also speaks of protection. You know, it's kind of scary in the dark, but when you flip the light on, then, then you, you're protected. That's why, you know, around houses, that you've got those sensors, and when people walk under the sensor, phew, there's a light, because then people get scared. He's trying to rip you off, and they, they run away. So knowledge, protection, guidance. That's what light represents. Light is sown for the righteous. He, he, he imagines light like a seed that is sown, and, it, and it'll grow. So I, God says, I'm going to give this for you. And, and ultimately, you know, when Jesus comes back, this is when that light is completely sown. But even in our lives right now, God is sowing light into us. As we get into his word, there's that light. The Holy Spirit gives us light. When we're in fellowship with other believers, there's that light. It gives us that knowledge, gives us that protection, gives us that guidance. That's what we need. And also, he says, and gladness for the upright of heart. Gladness is also sown in, in, into us. Um, 
I was thinking about how some people say, well, yeah, you're telling me that I should repent of that sin, you know, whatever it may be. I'm thinking specifically about, like, I've heard people say, I, 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 yeah, I can sleep with my girlfriend and stuff like that. God wants me to be happy, right? Not necessarily. God wants you to be holy, and if you're holy, then you will be happy. But if you seek for happiness, then you just make God into sort of a genie, and you just go and rub the bottle, and he, he just comes out and gives you whatever your wish is. You know, your wish is my command, and that's your God. But God's not like that. He wants you to be holy, and when you're holy and set apart for him, then you're happy. There's gladness sown into your life, this joy that comes from just being right with God. And then he just finishes, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Psalm 98, another messianic psalm. A song of praise to the Lord for his salvation and judgment. Again, looking ahead to the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial reign. And it says, it's a psalm. Now, we've been studying the psalms, but I don't know if we've ever really defined what a psalm is. But here's, here's a good definition. A psalm is instrumental music. It is a poem set to notes. That's essentially the definition of a psalm. Instrumental music or a poem set to notes. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. There he goes again. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Of our God. This is speaking of the thousand year reign. Now, when the Lord comes back, he is going to fulfill with the nation of Israel uh, several promises that he has given to them. And one of them comes to us in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. It's easy to remember. Jeremiah 31, 31. And it speaks to, it speaks to us of the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about and Jesus fulfilled. You remember at the Last Supper, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which was shed for you. He's referring to what we're about to read here in Jeremiah 31, 31. This is a covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, with the house of Judah. And, and he, he allows us as Gentiles, if you're not Jewish, he allows us to enter into it through Christ. We enter into this covenant. Now look what it says. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now, this is a, a wonderful promise that is re revealed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, how is he going to put his law in their minds and hearts? Well, how does he do it with us? It's by the Holy Spirit of God. When, we're, when we receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. We're born again. The Spirit of God writes the law of God on the hearts of his people and on, on, and on our minds. And this is what will happen, by and large, with the nation of Israel at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. They are going to call out to the Lord, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He will come back. They will receive him en masse as a nation, and they will then 
be born again, and they'll enter into the millennial kingdom. So that's one that's even given to us in Jeremiah, but there's another one I want to read to you. It's out of Jeremiah 33, verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called the Lord our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. So this is the messianic promise that Jesus Christ, the son of David, is going to come back, the branch of David. He's going to grow up and he is um, going to rule and reign on this earth over the nation of Israel, but over the whole world. And we're going to be with him as believers. We're going to be co-ruling and co-reigning with Christ in glorified bodies at that time. Because during the rapture of the church, uh, we're going to get new bodies fit for heaven, but also fit to rule and reign. Bodies that will not die, bodies that will not grow old or, or, or get sick, no more tears. That's going to be an amazing thing. So that's what's coming. Now look in verse 4 back in Psalm 98. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness, he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Now, I want to just focus in on that word for a little bit because this is a real buzzword right now, equity. Every time you, practically every time you turn on the television or the, the radio, some newscast, social media, you're hearing about equity. Let me just give a brief definition of what they are talking about when they mean equity and what the Lord here is talking about. In the world now, what when they talk about equity, they're talking about equality of outcome, not equality of opportunity. So in the West, we've had freedoms for many, many years, hundreds of years. We've had these freedoms. And we've had opportunities in the West to do business, to work hard, get ahead, that kind of thing. And because of that, there are some people within the society that have more than others. And then there are others that come along and say, well, that's not right. We need to have equity, meaning we need to all end up at the same place in the end. Equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. So that's what the world's talking about right now. Basically, it's a socialist takeover of the West. What he's talking about, the, the psalmist, he's talking about equity in a different sense. He's talking about justice. Okay, he's talking about a judge who's coming to judge the world rightly with perfect justice. Um, Acts chapter 17, verse 30, Paul in Athens cries out, truly these Times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, for he has chosen a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, and he has given assurance to all of this by raising him from the dead. He is going to judge the world in righteousness by the resurrected Christ. That's what this is talking about. This is equity in judgment, perfect judgment. Jesus spoke about this in the book of Revelation. In the, the, the seven letters to seven churches, he spoke about ruling and reigning with a rod of iron. That rod speaks, of, it's like a staff, right? It speaks of leadership. It also speaks of judgment. And a rod of iron 
is a very, very strict rod. He is going to judge perfectly. This is something that blows our minds because whenever we look around, we, we don't see things completely right in the world. We don't see perfect justice. As a matter of fact, this is one of the great things about Christianity is that there are some people in this world who will never see justice in their, in their lifetime. They will never see it. And if there's no such thing as God and there's, if there's no such thing as the resurrection, they're never going to see it in eternity. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and there will be perfect justice in that time. He's going to make everything right. And that's a great hope for us, isn't it? It's not a hopeless existence. We, we're looking beyond this present lifetime, and we're bringing people along with us saying, hey, you know, this, this ship is going down. This is the Titanic. It's doomed. But there is a kingdom that's going to last forever. Do you want to get on board? This is the kingdom that I'm involved with. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He'll bring us in if we'll just repent and, and trust in him. And so we're bringing people into that kingdom. So this is what he's talking about. Perfect justice. He's going to judge the people with equity. Psalm 99. Praise to the Lord for his holiness. Again, holiness being moral perfection, wholeness. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. He dwells, it says here, between the cherubim. Now, this is a picture for us of the mercy seat. Do you remember on the Ark of the Covenant? that there were these two cherubim that had their wings extended over the mercy seat when their faces were looking down upon that mercy seat, right? Now, this, of course, is a picture of the heavenly scene. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He is, uh, another word for it is our propitiation. He is our wrath-appeasing sacrifice in and of himself. And these angels over the mercy seat, they're looking down on it, and one time of year in the temple... The high priest could go in with the blood of an animal, and he could sprinkle it on that mercy seat. And that's where God said, I will meet with you. This is a tremendous picture for us of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us, bringing us into the greater tabernacle in heaven with his own blood, not the blood of an animal, but his own. And we're there in him. Now, notice what it says here. He dwells between the cherubim. The Lord reigns. He's talking here about a future reign of Jesus Christ, and I believe that when Jesus comes back, sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, walks into Jerusalem, that he's actually going to sit on the mercy seat as the throne. This is my own personal opinion. That's where I believe that he's going to be there doing that, ruling and reigning from the mercy seat for a thousand years. Um, in that position. It'll be, like, it'll be like his throne. Verse four, the king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his foot, footstool. He is holy. Notice, he loves justice. He established equity, and he executed justice. In other words, God, the Lord Jesus, when he comes back, he's going to punish evil. He is going to execute and enforce righteousness, his law. Now, when you read through the Sermon on the Mount, um, Matthew chapters 5 to 7, you see that what Jesus Christ does there is he internalizes the law. He says, you have heard it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you even have hatred in your heart, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even look with lust, you committed adultery. And he goes on like that. That's going to be the law in the kingdom. It's not just going to be the external, but it's also going to be the internal. This is perfect justice. And he knows how to execute that. So that's what's going to be coming in the thousand-year reign. It's almost mind-blowing to think about how perfect things will be on the earth at that time. 
Um, Verse 6, Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance he gave them. You answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives, though you took vengeance on their deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Now, the psalmist brings up three giants of Israel, Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. Now, you you remember um, Moses and Aaron were both priests. They're, They're from the priestly family. Moses was a leader. Aaron was specifically the high priest. And Samuel was a prophet. And these three converge in in one specific way. Each one of them interceded for the nation of Israel. They interceded, they pleaded with God to forgive the nation for the things that the nation had done. And you see this several times. Um, Thinking specifically about Samuel, when they had asked for a king, and um, God says, I didn't want you to have a king. I want to be your king. But since you asked for a king, I'll give you a king. And then at the inauguration of Saul, Samuel gets up and says, you shouldn't have asked for a king. Nevertheless, he gave you one. Um, But know this, that if you wander from him, he's going to judge you just like he does all the other nations. But he said, but far be it from me that that I should sin against God in ceasing to pray for you. I'm going to keep praying for you. I'm going to intercede for you. This is what all three of these giants did. They interceded for the nation. And it says, um, and God answered them. You you answered, verse 8, you answered them, O Lord our God, you were to them God who forgives, though you took vengeance on their deeds. They were judged, but then God forgave them. And then they were restored. Psalm 100 Psalm 100, this is where we're going to finish tonight. A song of praise for the Lord's faithfulness to his people. This is a song of thanksgiving. Short little psalm. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves, or you could render that it is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now let's just dwell on those words a little bit. We're we're his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now, um, being a sheep is is not a high compliment because sheep are kind of dumb and they get in trouble and they lose their way, but he is a good shepherd. He takes care of us. Now, you know the the famous psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, I don't lack anything. He gives me everything that I need. Not all my greeds, but all my needs. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. So there are times when God will make us lie down. We're too busy, we're stressed or whatever, lie down. Sometimes uh, we get sick. And we have to lie down. You, know? you, need to, you need to slow down, son. You're going too fast. And he just allows the sickness into my life. Okay. He makes me lie down. In green pastures, uh, literally in, um, amongst um, leaves of tender grass, just, you know, very, the, the, the short, soft, tender grass that sheep love to eat. I was reminded when I, when I first got saved, just sitting under Skip Heitzig's teaching, just just, this is so good. And I just grew and grew and grew from that, that teaching. He made me lie down in, in green pastures. He l- leads us beside still waters. Still waters, taking a drink, refreshing times. Remember the, Jesus with the woman at the well. He who drinks of this water is going to thirst again, but he who drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. She said, give me that water. Spiritual Refreshment. That's the kind of thing he's talking about. Leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. 
So your soul sometimes needs that restoration, you know, especially, of course, when we come to the Lord, we need to be restored. But there are times when we're just out of sorts. and We go to the Lord, Lord, I, I don't, can you just take this problem? And he just restores us back to normal. Beautiful. And it says he leads us on paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. He leads us through life because we're called by his name. You're Christian. You're called by the name of Christ. And he takes that seriously and he leads you everywhere that he wants you to go. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When you're afraid and you think everything's coming down on you, it's good that, that the shepherd has a rod to beat the wolves away and a staff to guide you along that path. You know he's going to take care of you. And so this is what he's saying. We are the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. This is a great model for us for ministry. And it, it's really speaking of the way the Jews would go to the tabernacle or to the temple. When they would come in, they would enter into his gates with thanksgiving, so they were thanking him for the things that he'd done for them. And then they would begin to praise him for the person that he was. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be thanking him for the, the, the ways that he's blessed us. And just enumerate them. We could go, spend a lot of time doing that. If you're ever up at night, by the way, and you can't get to sleep, just go through A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, and just each one, like an acronym, just thank him for something that is like A. Lord, I, I thank you for the apple that I ate today. B, thank you for that banana, whatever. You know, just thanking him for things. And as you get through, you're just like, wow, God's done so much in my life today. Thank him for what he's done, and then praise him for who he is, for his character and his nature. That's another good thing you can use the alphabet as an acronym for. Try to go through the alphabet and think of all the, the character and nature of God with the alphabet. You're all knowing. You're benevolent. You know, um, caring. Yeah. And just keep going down the line like that. It's really good. So this is a great model for prayer. By the way, when you begin with thanksgiving, you start with an attitude of gratitude, and your, your prayer life will be blessed. And when you begin to praise him as you start your prayers, you have a spirit of expectation because you're saying, I'm reminding myself of who you are, and you're going to be consistent with that as you answer my prayers. Yeah? Father, I pray. I thank you. Lord, tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you've gathered us here. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you've en enabled us to pray together. I thank you, Lord, that um, we've been able to sing. I'm thankful for beauty that you gave us today. It was beautiful. The last two days have been gorgeous. And the flowers, Lord, as Richard has reminded us, these simple things, but they're beautiful. And we just want to stop and say, thank you, Lord. You're awesome. But Lord, also, we praise you for being a wonderful, awesome, powerful God, and that you're coming back, and you're the just judge, and you're going to rule and reign. And Lord, we, we're thankful that you're also a very patient God, and your patience means salvation for many, many people. This is why you're dragging your heels to the judgment, because you want to see people come into the, your kingdom before the end comes. And I pray for anyone here or anyone watching online who does not yet know you, that right at this moment, they would turn in repentance, turning from sin, and faith in what you did for them on the cross, that you died for their sins. And they would just say, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you died for me, and I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I want to be born again. And I pray that you'd bring them into the kingdom right at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, God bless you guys. Have a good week. By the way, we're having a, a service on Good Friday, 7 o'clock in here. Um, it's just going to be a, a short service, like an hour service. We're going to have songs about the cross. We're going to have a little message, prayer time, and we're going to take communion together, and then we'll have fellowship. That'll be it. So if you can make it, it would be great to see you. If you need prayer for anything, come on up. Otherwise, have some fellowship.